Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Outdoor Service. We're very fortunate to have Julia Holloman and Molly Noel here for special music today. Let's give them a hand. Thank you for being here. We'd like to invite you to join us for our hymn of praise. We'd also like to invite you to move your seats if you need to get into shade and get yourself into a comfortable space. Today's hymn of praise is Be Not Afraid. You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall want Good morning. Great to see you all here this morning, and I'm glad that we uh, had that tune because um, while we were all singing, everybody was still bringing in chairs to accommodate more people. So please, that's awesome. Thank you for um, 
moving yourselves around, as Damien said, to wherever you need to be, get comfortable. Uh, we know that sun gets hot out there. If this is your very first time at Outdoor Worship at Snowmass Chapel, welcome. I'm Sharla Belinsky. I'm our senior pastor here at the chapel. This is Billy Tweedy, our new associate pastor. He's three weeks in and still here. Four weeks in? Three, four, something like that. We are so grateful to have... Uh, Billy here with us, and you're going to hear from him a little bit later this morning. On July 7th, we're actually doing a commissioning service during our regular worship service. We'll have just a, a little moment there to acknowledge his new ministry. We're also going to be acknowledging um, Julie Ressler uh, and her new work at the chapel, which is an extension of what she's been doing, but an expanded role. So we'll do that at the same time. And then also following that, We'll have a church-wide barbecue right here. So July 7th, mark your calendars. It's always a great event, the barbecue, and I'm happy that we get to tag on with these other fun events. So um, please mark your calendar for that. If there are any uh, folks that have you know, kids here, grandkids here, what have you, we've got a vacation Bible school coming up July 1st through 3rd. It's a short three-day, half-day uh, event for um, kids in diapers through fourth grade. So we'd love to have the more the merrier. You can uh, register online or you can talk to Coulter, who's right here in the plaid shirt with his hand up. Out of diapers. Oh, the last two weeks I've been saying in diapers. Well, you know, whatever. They might show up. Coulter, you might have to hold some babies. <laughs> Out of diapers through fourth grade. That does make more sense than what I've been announcing, come to think of it. <laughs> Anyway, Coulter uh, runs the gamut with our kids here at the chapel. He's also got a middle school event happening right after this service. So if you're in middle school, uh, feel free to join in. They have some fun things planned. I think it's at 1130. Is that correct? Yeah. So um, Coulter is a busy man in the summertime. And our camp Smashbox is also going on, which is why, boy, we try to keep these grounds green. But it's hard with 100 kids here each week. And I wouldn't change it because it's pretty awesome if you're ever around uh, take a peek here uh, in the summertime during the week. It's, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, we're glad you're with us. I want to say a quick prayer, and then we'll release all the kiddos that would like to go with Coulter right now for Sunday school. Uh, but let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come into your midst today as a community of faith. So, so, so grateful to be together, to be able to worship in this amazing beautiful place that we get to call home. Even if we're just visiting for the first time, this is our home because it's where you have placed us in the middle of your great creation and beauty in this majestic morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So as we gather to worship you this morning, God, I pray that you just open our ears and our hearts to all that you would have us know this day draw us ever closer to you through all that we do in this service, and we give you great thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And for all the kids who are here who would like to join Coulter, he again is back here with the plaid shirt on. You're always welcome to stay in church, but if you would like to go, they do have fun, and um, blessings on all of the children and on Coulter as you head your way out. Thank you. Uh, my name is Julia Holloman. I'm so happy to be back here at the Snowmass Chapel with you all. I just wanted to give you a quick window into the selection. I'll be singing with Molly. Um, the title translates to Come My Beloved, and I just think that's a wonderful invitation for us to come to worship with an open mind and open hearts. And you're all here, so thank you all for being here today, and I hope you enjoy.
This morning's reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. When evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. When he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are, that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm, he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? The word of the Lord. Good morning. On this beautiful, amazing day, um, in which we will also um, continue the beautiful amazement of this uh, day with after our communion sacrament, we will be entering into the sacrament of baptism. We'll be baptizing Paris. So that you are all invited after this service to join us down at the river uh, to celebrate that glorious event. And she's back there in the back. I see her. And speaking of water, which is important for baptism, my story, um, well, the disciples are dealing with some water in the story. And I thought since I was getting to know you all and you getting to know me, I would give you a couple of stories about boats and water with me. I'm going to start. I was eight years old. I grew up mostly in Milford, Connecticut. And... Um, my family loves fishing in Long Island Sound. So I learned how to fish at a young age. I also learned how to swim at a very young age, mostly because my grandfather was very much one of those sink or swim kind of guys. So I got tossed into the Long Island Sound more than once or twice in my days. On this particular adventure, I had already moved to Texas and I'd come back for the summer, and we were going to go fishing, and I hadn't had my sea legs yet. So we went out, and it was a glorious day. I can remember the start of this trip was amazing because we were catching bluefish, which is like an apex predator fish, very fun to catch. My grandfather said they taste delicious, but it was a lot of butter to make them taste delicious. I just remember them tasting like butter when we caught them. But... As we fished and caught fish, a storm rolled in. And the little, like, 
subtle nuances of the boat turned into big waves and water crashing over the side. And I immediately began to kind of feel not well. And I thought to myself, I was with my cousin. I was like, I'm just going to go lay down in the cab of the boat and see if this passes. And my cousin who lived in Connecticut knew, like, you, you don't go inside the boat to feel better. You go inside the boat to throw up. Like, you're going to get sick. So he alerts my grandfather of my, my idea. And as I'm walking down into, the, like, the hull of the boat, I feel my grandfather's large hand grab my life preserver and toss me in one, one fell swoop into, over the side of the boat. Because he know he's like, no throwing up in the boat. That was always like a rule. So there I am, cast into the sea, pretty good sized waves, a storm rolling in. I went from being afraid of being sick to afraid of being drowning. I don't know what was worse at the time, but it did pass. I got in the boat. We went home. So that's, you know, the first time I tried to sleep on a boat, um, it just didn't really work. Now, the next story I have is about a friend who tried to sleep on a boat. So I did a race called the Texas Water Safari. It goes from San Marcos, Texas, to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's one of those Texas races that just wants to prove to the rest of the world that Texans are tougher than everybody else. So it starts off, and we're racing. You have 100 hours to complete 260 miles. We're probably about 80 hours into the race. And everything happens from crossing down waterfalls, portaging through the night through like fields of mosquitoes because the river isn't passable, to alligators on the banks, all the things. And we get to this point, and my, my partner Colby has just, he, he hardly knows who he is anymore. He's so delirious and tired. And I implore him, I'm like, Colby, just shut your eyes and take a little nap. I'm in the back. I got us. Just take an hour rest, and maybe it'll, you'll come back refreshed. And about 10 minutes into him relaxing and shutting his eyes, I don't know. I know it sounds like a fish story here, but I think it was probably the better part of a five-pound carp. Jumps out of the water. And we have these lights on the front of the boat. The carp jumps at the light, hits Colby square in the chest, knocks him out of the boat, and the whole boat tips over. So, sleeping on a boat in tumultuous times is truly a divine thing that only Jesus can do, as far as I'm concerned, in the story. Um, but the story isn't just about Jesus this morning. It's also about the disciples and their fear. They're terrified of the raging sea. They're terrified that Jesus doesn't love them anymore. I have to believe that their fears play a significant role, a significant role in their lives and a significant role in our lives. Whether we are on a boat or just living our daily lives, fear dictates so many of our choices, our decisions, and our actions. Maybe it's that argument between spouses, whether or not to spend the money to go on the vacation, except it's not about the money to go to the beach. It's about, is there going to be enough money when we get back to pay the bills and buy food? Or maybe it's that discernment process, whether to take a new call with another congregation and leave behind all the good reasons to stay both sides fear, and they harbor each other about losing my identity, potentially, of these people know me, and I'm going to this new, unknown place, and will they want to get to know me? Fear, you're, you're just, it sits with us in all sorts of decisions, especially when it comes to teenagers. For parents, or for the teenager, it's like, I want the keys to the car. I want to go with my friends. I know they're going to have the best time they've ever had, and I'm going to miss out. And it's all because you won't let me go. And the parent is terrified because they know nothing good happens after a certain hour, and their kid is out there, and all of the wild unknowns are unleashed. So it's safe to say fear lurks just under every surface 
of a lot of difficult moments in our lives. But I have to wonder, is fear unfaithful? That question struck me in today's gospel reading. Notice Jesus' sharp words to his disciples. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? That's a burn. That hurts. So what do you think? Is Jesus equating fear with lack of faith? It troubles me because I've long thought that faith doesn't banish fear, but it mostly just helps you cope with fear. And at the same time, I do see the connection between, lack, between fear and lack of faith. So let me get at it from a different angle. And we'll just start with the disciples because they're the easiest. They've been following Jesus for a good while now. He's called them out of love. He's seen them pick up the brokenhearted and heal them. He's seen them cast out demons. He's healed, seen them heal the sick. He's seen them get in fight getting fights with the Jewish authority and the temple authorities who didn't care about the disciples at all. He's seen them, he's just, they've just seen him feed 5,000 people with not enough food. So there is an abundance of love happening in the story. When I think of faith, primarily I think of the word trust. Not simply as belief, but the kind of trust that motivates you to action. For example, you only let the people you trust watch your kids. And you don't trust, if you don't trust your employer that much, you're probably not going to give all you can at work. Does that make sense? Faith as trust? So as I share with you all, um, Hold on. The sermon may have gotten a little jumbled up from the last service. So there are things that we do when we get afraid. The disciples get angry and aggressive and accusatory towards Jesus, and those are pretty common reactions to fear. How do you all react? in fear. For me, fear paralyzes me. I stand there like the possum in the fantastic Mr. Fox. It feels like my eyes are just swirling sometimes. Making it impossible and very difficult to make any good choice. So maybe the issue isn't that the disciples are understandably afraid because of the storm. It's that they have allowed their fear to overtake them so that they don't come to Jesus and say something like, Jesus, help me. We need your help. But rather they come with, Jesus, don't you care that we are dying? It isn't trusting or faithful request, is it? It's a fear-induced accusation. We get these in life. Now there is an important disclaimer here. Whatever the quality of the disciples' interaction with Jesus, what does he do? He still calms the sea. He cares for them. He looks out for them. And the same goes for us. We don't have to have perfect faith in God to respond. Indeed, you can be paralyzed by fear, assume the worst about God, and still receive God's mercy and love. And in truth, sometimes it might be the most faithful move because God and Jesus can handle everything we throw at them. Now, something I've learned about fear over the years and am reminded in the disciples' interactions is that fear doesn't evaporate the stilling of the sea, with the stilling of the sea, but is transformed from the paralyzing anxieties that assume the worst kind of holy awe at the presence and power of the one that is in their midst. They thought they knew Jesus, and now they have to wonder if they really did know Jesus. I think that's the invitation for us as well, to bring our fears, anxieties, concerns, 
the best we can and watch as they are transformed and as we are once again amazed at this God who never ceases to surprise us. So as I share life with this new community and wonder and learn about this Snowmass Chapel, this Christian community, I wonder if some of our biggest work is to remind each other that while God may be so much bigger than we thought, and that while life and faith may be at times so much harder than we bargained for, the reminder is God will not abandon you. Not with temptuous storms of life, not with gale force winds of fears, rather God will come stilling the wind and the waves, calming the fear-ridden heart, telling us again and again that we are God's own beloved children and calling us to greater faith. I believe this work to be holy work, comforting each other with the news that God loves you and God will not abandon you. And neither will each of us. When we are doing this, we are playing one of the greatest roles assigned throughout Scripture. Think about those fearful moments in Scripture and who shows up, an apostle, an angel, a prophet, and they come with the words, do not be afraid. Each time we say and hear these words, we join with all the saints who have gone before us, caught up in the Spirit, they found the courage not just to survive, but to flourish, not just to live, but to find life abundant, and not just to get by, but to know the favor we enjoy in Jesus Christ, to dare great things, to expect great things, and ask for great things, and to share great things. So I finished this morning with the simplest of challenges. Each week we pass an offertory plate. And I would just like to make a disclaimer, the offertory plate is not a tip jar. It is not on how good I've preached. It's not how amazing our special musicians are. It's not how well someone has read the prayers. The offering is a reminder that when we come to this holy place, we are offering our whole lives up, our fears, our joys, our anger, our sorrow, all of us. And we participate in church through the hearing of scripture, through the breaking of bread, through the hearing of prayers, through wonderful music. We also pass this liturgical item around as a moment of participation in that reminder that we are offering ourselves to God once again our ordinary lives, just like that ordinary bread and wine that is on that table, and we are asking God to make them once again extraordinary. And it's not made extraordinary just so that we can be in this place and feel so good about ourselves, but it's to do what that final blessing says, which is to go back out over that bridge and look at the world in the face and remind them to not be afraid and God loves them. So as that offertory plate goes around, be reminded that God loves you and to not be afraid. Amen. God of power and love, we listen to the stories, miracles, and the doubts and all the things that can happen today. We look at the waves of misfortune, distress, misery, distrust, anger and wonder how we can still those waves. We feel pressure of power and fear flooding into our lives, threatening to drown us and wonder, where are you? Forgive us for the littleness of our faith. Forgive us our doubts. Help us to place our trust in you. Help us to fix our eye on you and on the ministries you have called us to. For we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In a moment, the servers will come forward passing those offertory plates and prepare us for communion. You're welcome to make that offering. You can do that with, by
by putting something in the offertory plate, or you can find the QR codes on your um, sheet or in on the, on the pillars over there. Um, we are so grateful for the offerings that come from this church, and we know that the offerings that come into this church go back out into the community. So be reminded, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. As the plate is passed on both sides, please do touch it. Pass it. You don't have to put anything in. As Billy said, put your heart into it. Put your fears and your anxieties and your grief and your worries into it as you touch it and pass it to the next person. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for that message, Billy, to be reminded. And if our communion servers want to come on forward as well, thank you. God, you made us and the world and everything in it. All the good we see comes from you. You have always loved us, but people have not always loved you. You sent Jesus to show us how to live and to bring us back to you again. Our Lord Jesus Christ died for us on the cross so that through your spirit, we can all be your people. And so with thanks, we praise you. We're here because on the night before he died for us, our Lord shared a meal with his friends. There he took some bread he gave thanks to you, God, broke it into pieces, and said, this is my body. Do this, and know that I am with you. Later, he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to you. He shared it with the disciples and said, this is my blood, which brings new life. Do this, and know that I am with you. 
And so remembering Jesus Christ who died and was raised to new life by you, now send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and this wine can become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Through this food, give us strength to live as your people. Help us to care for your world and for each other in the ways that Jesus showed us. We praise you, we thank you, and we bless you. As together we all pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And please know that whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey of faith, whatever it is you may have done in life, all people are welcome at this, our Lord's table. And I will serve those up front, and then we will come and form sort of two areas. So feel free to just make your way forward.
this time, we'd like to invite you to join us for our closing hymn, a wonderful song called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. How many of you just got transported back to like your grandma's kitchen like I did? <laughs> My grandma taught me that song. I think I was probably six years old. Anyway, beautiful old hymn. Um, thank you all so much for being here and sharing this worship service with us this morning. We're so glad you did. If you are visiting for the very first time, welcome, if I didn't already say that. And if you are um, a fairly newcomer or even a visitor and you'd like to be on our uh, list of uh, to receive our newsletter, we have some welcome cards at our welcome wagon as you exit. We'd love you to fill that out and just stay in touch so we can um, stay in touch with you. Um, and uh, we are always looking for volunteers to help us with both our services, especially in the summer as we have more and more people here. So if you're a volunteer this morning, thank you. Uh, and if you would like to sign up to uh, either you know, host, be a greeter, uh, fellowship time, scripture reading, all of those things are needs, and there is a sign-up sheet. Oh, Sue's got it right there. Look at her showing that on display. Thank you, Sue. Uh, so as you exit, you can also sign up for a spot this summer as well. Thank you for that. Glad you were here this morning. If you can join us for the baptism, we're going to walk right across the bridge to the right and to that um, grassy area right on the creek. We can't do the baptism in the creek today. I think the water is still a little too high and cold, but we're going to be right next to it for Paris's baptism. And so on behalf of the Andrade family, uh, we invite you to come join us for that. Um, it'll take us a few minutes to set up. And uh, welcome to little Paris to the Snowmass Chapel and the uh, community of faith. We're happy to be doing that baptism this morning. With that, Billy, I'll let you do the final blessing. Thank you. 
as you cross the bridge and go back into the world, know that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ goes with you. Let him lead you to the quiet places of your heart where he will meet you. Know that he loves you and listens to you with gentle understanding. Whatever you are experiencing, whatever you are feeling, whatever you might be enduring, may the strength and peace and joy be with you now and always. Amen.